Thank you. All right, that concludes any of your Tea Party's questions. I now have questions. If you have further, feel free to raise your hand. We'll bring it up. Uh, Jay, you were the favorite, I must tell you. I have more questions for Jay than anybody else. Nick, you were second. So due to that, Jay, we're going to start with you. Mr. Kramer, several years ago at this same event, you were 100% in favor of selling the Bear Beach Electric to FPL. What happened? Well, I, I still am in favor of doing that. Um, I did the, uh, I was very energetic and it took me about a month and a half to get together the, uh, the items for a partial sale, uh, which definitely sold to, uh, to FPNL. The only difference between the, the, the partial sale and the full sale is that the partial sale did get, also get our rates down, but it didn't, uh, it didn't cause a, a threat to our services and it didn't raise our taxes. Um, you, you know, if you ask the question of what happened, you know, I, I've got to, you know, refer back to the August 30th article where I, I outlined a partial sale before the election. Uh, you know, I was there uh, and, I, and I outlined exactly what I was going to do. And I don't think there was any uh, ambiguity to it. All right. Nick. Please explain why a municipal, a municipal monopoly is not a monopoly. How is the City of Vero Beach electric monopoly a free market? That's a good question. Actually, when I was writing this, I, I, I tripped up on that myself. Uh, the only meaningful distinction I can give, uh, thanks Mark. Um, the only uh, meaningful distinction I can give, and, and, and uh, my friend Dan uh, touched on it too. The, uh, the, the monopoly that we have as Zero Electric is unregulated, as, as Dan pointed out. But, but we also have a representative government where the people that run that business are, are the city council. So every year, to the extent, every year to the extent you have an issue with this monopoly, and I'll give you that it is, um, that, um, we have a meaningful way to deal with that. On the other hand, FPNL is a true monopoly. A true monopoly, once they're in place, they are regulated. We have no say in what they do as a municipality. We become mere customers, and um, they have to deal with Florida Public Service Commission. And the Public Service Commission does two things, one good, one bad. What they do good is they um, hold back the reins of a monopoly and say, hey, we realize you can charge any price you want, um, so we're here to say you can't charge anything you want, but uh, the state of Florida also uh, assists FPL in re then re receiving a risk-free return of 11% a year, which is outrageously high in, in, in currently. So I'm just almost done. So, um, well, well, let's face it. Thing. So we are a monopoly, a monopoly that we're a monopoly where we have to an answerable monopoly. Let's call it that. Thank you, Nick. All right. I'm going to ask each one of you to answer this question. Um, and why don't we just start on this end with Dan and go the other way this time. Assuming the power plant is sold, what would be your choice for the use of the land? Certainly, 
once again, I uh, don't necessarily agree with the premise of the question. I sort of agree with what I said and what Jay said, which is regardless of whether we sell or don't sell um, to FPL, um, the days of Big Blue are, 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 are limited. So Big Blue is going away one way or another. And um, we were having this discussion the other night. I'm, uh, um, as some of you know, I'm uh, quite a waterman. I spent a lot of time out on our river. And, um, you know, uh, uh, um, Enterprise that made money being a marina would be, I think, the highest and best use, and that could be surrounded with uh, businesses and um, and residential. However, that is a thin old piece of water, so um, it would be a big job to dredge that out and point to, to a point where that would make it a, a viable marina. We also have the problem of being quite a ways from the inlet, so we'd have to do a lot of study before we went that way. But as far as the development that made money, that kept the land in, in the city's um, uh, books and was um, in character with our town, I would say something marina related. That was Nick Thomas. Pilar Turner. I would love to see this land used for something beautiful. I would love Amelie Lloyd Bridge to become a destination within our community, become a highlight, a special place. I would like it to see with some conservation, environmental uh, aspect, whether we have a beautiful boardwalk where many people can come and enjoy the treasure of our Indian River Lagoon. But as far as actual development of this area, I'd love to see us uh, begin another process like our vision plan, pull together a group of citizens um, and have some kind of agreement on what we can go forward for as a vision. Uh, Jay Kramer, uh, you know, just to give you an example in a nutshell, I think it's uh, that land would be better off in, in, in private hands in a, in a highest and best use environment that's compatible with our neighborhoods. We need to make sure that that land can uh, can draw income for the city, but on the other hand, needs to be uh, in tune with our with the, the flavor of Vero Beach in the neighborhoods. Um, however, it's, it's it's kind of interesting to me that uh, we would even be asked what would be happening with that land. Most of the decisions that have come up to us really have been single bidder deals. Uh, you know, water and sewer is a single bidder deal. FPL is a single single bidder deal. I'm finding out that we've got plans for solid waste to uh, to be a single bidder deal with uh, waste management. Uh, some of our parkland is a single bidder deal. Um, I would uh, I would have to be very cautious about uh, answering the question uh, in respect that I'm sure there's probably people out there that already have a purpose for that that just have not yet surfaced. I think it's fairly accurate to say that there's probably people, I'm sorry, Brian Henny, it's fairly accurate to say that there probably are some people out there that already have some plans for that property. Uh, but the, the land is protected by the charter and it's something that absolutely has to go before the voters and I think that uh, it, would take, it would take a lot of study and a lot of talk, a lot of discussion and uh, it's something that the voters would have to consider whether or not they wanted to, uh, to turn that into a money maker or to turn that into some environmentally sensitive, you know, parkland, something, uh, a, a destination kind of, uh, Craig Fletcher, um, under no circumstances would I vote to sell that land for commercial development, for housing or anything. This, uh, if, if, if we sold that property, how long do you think that money would last on the, in the general fund? It would, it's just, I just can't even conceive of that. Under no circumstances would I do with residential. Um, I, I look at it, uh, the first thing is uh, that area there for a marina would per be perfect because we used to have dredges or uh, barges come in there to unload, unload diesel fuel. It's already dredged over 20 feet right now. It'd make a beautiful combination. I look at it as a combination of a, a, a park, uh, a walking exercise area, a marina, maybe some tennis courts, but in, the, in the, some way to return funds to the general return money to the general fund to help us out with the, with the support of the rest of the parks division. But I look at it strongly as a park, a park, a marina, and some tennis courts. All right, thank you. Nick, you ready to go again? Yes, sir. Good. Nick, 
if you think it is a good idea to use electric fund revenue to keep taxes low, why would it be a bad idea to raise utility rates enough to zero property taxes? <laughs> um, okay, that's a, that's a clever one. Is that you okay, Mark? Um, Stuart, uh, and we talked about this earlier, Stuart and I at Vero Beach are pretty similarly situated. And again, thanks to Mark Schumann for, for his good work. Um, my understanding is that Stuart, they don't uh, have an enterprise fund that's feeding their budget, and they um, and they do pay taxes approximately twice what we do. Um, so if I understand the question, I don't have a problem supplementing our income with our electric uh, with your electric simply because it's the situation that we're in. You know, uh, if we were going to snap our fingers and build another city that looked exactly like Vero Beach, we probably would use FPNL, but that's not the situation we're in. Right now, we have a business. It's, it grew up historically, you know, Vero was the first town in this county. We were lucky enough to have the money to, to have a, a power plant, and then as development continued outside the city borders, people asked us to, to extend out. Now, I'm not sure I'm going to be done in 10 seconds. Um, 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Now I lost my, my train of thought. Um, generally, I, I tend to be, yes, a status quo type, type of person. What I don't want to do is, in the name of, of being against taking money from this enterprise fund, give away Vero Electric to the first person that comes along. I mean, remember, we're not getting much for this deal. We're getting, you know, every, all the money that's coming in is barely going to touch our hands before it's gone again. Um, we have a valuable business. How it got here is not particularly important, but it's a business that makes us like $5 million a year. Why in God's name would we give it away? All right, Jay. Jay, on September 5th, the paper reported that you indicated you were not running again. You stated it's just not as fun as it used to be. Two days later, you, two days later, deadline day, you and Nick Thomas dropped off your paperwork. Did you already have your paperwork uh, filled out when you indicated you may not run and who specifically talked you into running again? <laughs> <laughs> this is Jay Kramer. Uh, I can't say who specifically talked me into running because there was quite a multitude of people who did talk me into running. Um, it was, uh, I, I got a, a flurry of phone calls. Uh, quite frankly, that, that statement was really a, uh, a way to try to get some good people to come out and, uh, and run for office. Uh, you know, quite frankly, I'm, I'm a business person and, uh, you know, I. You know, if I'm not here, I'm out there making uh, making millions of dollars for myself, not saving millions of dollars for the people of Vero Beach. So for me, uh, you know, if, if somebody else could run and, and do an equal job as myself, um, I guess it's kind of selfish of me that, uh, that I could go out there and uh, get back to business and make money for myself. Uh, however, I did have an awful lot of people who had uh, convinced me that I needed to run again, convinced me that a lot of the programs that I started uh, need to continue uh, to uh, to move on, uh, and uh, you know, waiting to the last minute. I would suppose that's uh, uh, I guess that's a, a t tactic that people use to make sure that uh, uh, a lot of people don't jump in to uh, to run against you. Uh, just being, being frank with that question. All right. I'll have to admit, some, some of these questions appear to be uh, layups for some of the candidates. <laughs> so uh, we're going to avoid those. Um, but what I'd like to do, some of them, I'd like to, we'll, we'll go back to that in a minute. I'd like everybody to answer this question. Do you believe in spending more than you earn? And then tell us why you have the particular belief on that question you have and apply it to city government. And this time, let's um, start in the middle with Pilar. I absolutely do, this is Pilar Turner. I absolutely do not believe in spending more money than I earn. I have always been a fiscal conservative and will continue to do so with my own and with my city's money. 
I'll agree with that. Nick Thomas, um, I tend to be a saver myself. Uh, this is Dan Stone, and I uh, very sincerely do not believe in spending more than you earn. I've seen this problem with uh, clients, both uh, individuals and businesses, over the course of my uh, practice, uh, law practice, over 35 years. Uh, people do not know how to formulate a budget. Uh, they, once they have a budget, they can't live within the budget. Unfortunately, too many of our governments uh, have this problem. They want to spend more money than, uh, than, than what the tax revenue is. Uh, I, I think there's just a problem with in this whole country with poor fiscal uh, government management. Um, Calvin Coolidge said it real good, President Coolidge. He says there's uh, nothing easier in public life than spending public tax revenue because it really doesn't belong to anybody once it gets in that government uh, uh, bank. It, it just sits there, it's, it's there uh, available for spending. And uh, the, the urge to spend it is just unbearable for some candidates who don't have any fiscal control. So I, I definitely am a fiscal conservative, and I promise that if I'm elected as your council member, I will be as careful in spending the public money as I am in my own. Craig Fletcher, uh, spending more than you earn is called bankruptcy. Uh, there have been many, many cities around the country that are literally declaring bankruptcy. I hate to, I actually, I hate to, fan, uh, to, to face uh, Cindy, our finance director, if we try to do that. We have a new finance director that is absolutely sterling, silver quality lady. Really, really holds your feet to the fire. You go down and talk to her about something, you want to see how much something costs, and she'll say, no. And that's what you have to say. That's all you have to say is, no, I'm not going to spend more than I earn. That's why I still have a house of my own. Brian, hey, on a personal level, I'm a married man with kids, grandkids, a wife. Of course I spend more money than I earn. <laughs> Which makes me have to go out and earn some more to keep the wife and the kids and the grandkids happy. <laughs> of course. As an elected official, when I was on city council, I refused to spend more money than we took in. When you spend your money, you can't spend more. You can't put the burden on our kids and our grandkids. We've heard a whole lot of talk here tonight from candidates about underfunded pensions. The reason we have underfunded pensions is because we've had city councils that didn't mind spending more money than they had coming in and they refuse to pay for the benefits earned in the year that they were earned. And I fought for that for a long time and I continue to fight for the fiscal responsibility and not spending more money than we take in. Uh, Jay Kramer, uh, I, I think it's a pretty good consensus up here that you don't spend uh, more money than you have bringing in. Um, the last couple of years at City Council, I hope everybody has looked at the books and we have, uh, as a whole, have really agreed that you don't spend more than what you bring in. Uh, certainly, uh, I as a business person uh, know the effects firsthand that if you don't, uh, uh, don't take care of your finances, you're going to get punished and it's going to be pretty severe. Uh, also, working bankruptcy, I have had to clean up the messes of people who have spent too much money and have had to, uh, to take businesses back on track and get them back into the private place. Certainly in the government situation, you don't want to let this happen because it's your money and you're the one that's going to have to pay the price for it. Uh, on this issue, I would certainly hope that, uh, that you, the people, will become more engaged and watch over us politicians. Uh, certainly, uh, you might not have a council in the years to come that are as uh, fiscally conservative as ourselves. But vigilance is really something that the public needs to uh, uh, make themselves aware of. And you need to challenge the politicians to make sure that we stay within our bounds and we don't spend more than what's coming in. All right. Pilar, uh, just do we have as a city 
a unfunded um, pension obligations. We most certainly have unfunded. And, and what is the value of that? Our unfunded pension life obligation is 36 million, and we have other post-employment benefit liability yeah. okay. for up to 40 million. I'm just trying to establish a fact. This really isn't a question. Okay. So we have about 36 million unfunded pensions, and that happens every year, correct? In other words, it grows every year. It's continuing to grow because it's based on a rate of return of 7.75 percent, which so, we got 0.3 percent last year. Okay, so then I would like the six of you to ask that, answer that question again about being fiscally responsible and not spending more than you take in. Well, let's, uh, Clara, you started, right? Yes. Now let's start with Jay and go the other way. Jay Kramer. Uh, this was an actually an interesting uh, question because I talked to Cindy about this today. Um, actually, our general fund uh, uh, underfunding is about 63% uh, where it should be. Um, in 2010, it was actually 62%. Uh, it has turned around. Uh, we are making headway on, on the pension. Granted, it's probably not enough. Uh, we do need to make more headway on that. However, we have uh, reached the tipping point back in 2010, uh, and we are coming back from that, uh, from that point. The, uh, the, the pension fund certainly is something that we got to keep an eye on. It does uh, fluctuate quite a bit as employees pass away. The, uh, the, the uh, liability becomes less. As more employees retire, there is more liability put on the fund. Uh, so realistically, we've got to keep an eye on that, make sure that we have uh, adequate funding for those. Um, and absolutely paying out the, uh, the fund would definitely help quite a bit. Um, and certainly, if this, uh, the sale goes through, I think it is most uh, most pertinent to, uh, to pay up the underfunding. Uh, and I would certainly like to make sure we get an accurate number from it, you know, just how many employees that they're going to take. Because the employees that they don't take, if they exercise their retirement option, it's going to exacerbate the problem of a more severe uh, pension issue. All right. And, and the intent of asking you this question back again, all of you, is every one of you expressed that you were fiscally responsible would not spend more than we take in, but yet we've not funded our pension plans on an annual basis at the levels they need to be funded. So I'd like for you to square that fact with your previous answer. The uh, fact is that uh, we, we have, uh, Paul quotes the number of $36 million worth of not unfunded, but underfunded pension plans. The uh, two years in 2009 and 10, when I was on, uh, on city council, one of the things that I fought for uh, continually was that the benefits for the employees be paid for in the year that they're earned. It sounded like a broken record on city council. And I continue to stand by that policy. I think the only way that we're going to stop the ever-growing underfunded is to uh, pension plans, is to change pension plans. Let's take what we pay the employee now, and instead of having a defined benefit, let's have a defined contribution where the employee can take the money and put it whatever, whatever kind of IRA they want. And that's not cheating the employee out of anything that we currently give them, but it is ending the um, underfunded uh, pension plans for the uh, for the taxpayers because we will have then paid for the benefit in the year that it's earned and will be done. Change it from a defined benefit to a defined contribution. Craig Fletcher. We were handed this problem, we didn't create it. Uh, we're trying to solve it. In fact, we're paying, I think it's $3.1 million a year trying to catch up. Uh, I'd love to pay more to get it caught up so that it wouldn't be an albatross a stone around our neck, but we're using what we have in the, in the general fund to pay that up, and we just cannot catch up without uh, some radical solution. And I don't have to. But uh, I'm actually not going to spend any more than I have uh, to catch up to it. 
it's uh, going to be in our in our face uh, until we sell the uh, power plant in order to cap that off. It's just uh, an albatross that we inherited. Dan Stump again, and uh, this brings up another good point why we have to sell our electric uh, system, our electric utility system. Fiscal conservatism in the city of Vero Beach means not having a defined benefit pension plan because a defined benefit pension plan obligates the city of Vero Beach to make sure that there's enough money funded in the plan to pay a retired employee a defined benefit at a certain age, 62 or 65. And the problem is, in years past, as Mr. Fletcher said, this problem wasn't created by the current board, but in years past, there was created a defined, pension, a defined benefit pension plan, which did obligate the city to pay a defined benefit. And for whatever reason, that plan has not been well funded. And I don't think any of, us, any of us up here tonight can say specifically where the money is going to come from right now to make up this current obligation, because it is an obligation. It's a clear liability on the part of the city of Vero Beach to fund this plan. Offhand initially, I would have to say that some of the reserve that's going to be created by the sale of our electric system will be used. I'm not saying I want to wipe it all out, but some of it will probably have to be used to make good on this unfunded liability. It's unfortunate uh, that we have to meet our liability. But this is another reason why, because of this pension problem we have, why we must sell our electric utility system. Nick Thomas, two quick points. Um, Toby, uh, good try for a trick question, but um, when I say that I, um, uh, don't spend more than I uh, when I earn. I uh, I do have a mortgage, and I uh, pay my mortgage payment. I don't pay my house off every day, or every week, or every year. Um, so yes, I do carry some debt uh, on my home. I have equity in my home, but uh, yeah, I think you can be a budget conscious person and still um, operate with some debt. Um, but here here's the point I want to make uh, to turn this back around on you is that you know when I entered this race, and uh, Toby Toby didn't ask me. The circumstances under which I got in. But um, basically, it's sell Bureau Electric, it's a really good thing. Um, we're going to save millions of dollars. We're going to have award winning service. Oh no, now we're going to. Um, we're going to save the union, or we're going to save the mortgage, or the, our, uh, our uh, pension plan. Um, it's a moving reason. Uh, every time some of the uh, air is uh, put out of one reason, another one gets uh, gets put before you. It's not a good reason. If we need to deal with our pension plan, we need to deal with our pension plan, and we do that by looking at all the options. Selling our enterprise on Vero Electric is not the solution to that problem. Uh, they're two different issues. Say. Over 20, 25 years ago, private industry gave up on having defined contribution plan, defined benefit plans that we have today. When we came to council, we were concerned with um, was concerned with the pensions, and I was assured that in addition to the, the annual pension obligation for each employee, we were contributing an additional three million dollars to the pension fund every year to try to catch up with this unfunded liability. Unfortunately, the economy is still very, very low. We cannot get a 7.75% return on our investment, and I don't know who can tell me when we will. So we're continuing to fall further and further into this hole. The opportunity to reform our pension plan requires that we put in the funds of that obligation for the current obligation. So you need a, a large infusion of cash to convert your plan to what I call a pay-as-you-go, a defined contribution plan. And this is what we're moving forward with. Thank you. All right. Now I'm going to take off on that question that uh, was asked to Nick, which he answered. Nick, you're going to get a chance to answer this. And it, it had to do with using the electric 
fund revenues to put them in the general fund to keep our taxes low. In my mind, what they were asking is a philosophical question. Could you please uh, answer what do you think is the appropriate relationship of that type of activity, whether it's a power plant or any other business that the governmental entity known as the City of Bear Beach might own, to put funds in the general fund versus allowing ad valorem taxes to pay for those services which have traditionally been paid for by ad valorem taxes. Could you give us your philosophical approach to that? I'm not sure I have a philosophy about that. I uh, uh, realize that the state of the uh, city right now is that we do have a couple of great enterprise, uh, uh, enterprises. Uh, and they make good money for us. Uh, the electric system, the uh, water and sewer system. Uh, and it's a blessing, I think, that we don't have to pay more taxes because we have them. Um, I certainly don't have any philosophy that would tell me to give those things away because the government has their thing, fingerprints on them so we can pay more taxes. Mm. I, my philosophy is gratitude for good things we have, if that answers the question. It's fine that you started, Dan. Uh, thank you, Dan Stump again. I do not like the concept of using money and relying on money from the electric utility system to formulate a budget. Because as a fiscal conservative, I think the first thing we need to do is not be concerned so much as the amount of revenue that's coming to our budget. But what are the essential services that the city government should be providing to the city of Vero Beach and the residents? You know, city of Vero Beach is not necessarily Vero Beach City Hall. But what are the level of services that our residents should have? And what's the best way that our city government can provide those services? And you know, we just had a question earlier about the amount of unfunded pension liability that we have. And uh, we have that because the current system that Vero Beach employs to make up and carry out their budget is not working. We are not getting enough revenue from the electric utility system of Vero Beach to pay for our services. There has to be another way. I hate to raise that the warm taxes, but we might have to do it a little bit. I would encourage all of you this evening to go home and take a look at your total tax bill and what it is. I think you're going to find, like, mine is no different in concept from yours. The city of Vero Beach taxes is about 10% of your total real estate property tax bill. So we're talking about a very small amount. The amount of money that you're going to save every month from selling this system is going to far exceed any possible real estate tax increase. Thank you. Uh, Craig Fletcher, uh, as I understand the question, it was our philosophy, right? So, um, my philosophy is that smaller government is good. Uh, the ad valorem taxes should support the services. Um, and you can't get much simpler than that. Um, I don't know, I, I, I've been years that the power plant has been uh, artificially uh, supporting our low tax, uh, ad valorem taxes. And uh, that's going to change. We're going to have, it's not going to be any huge increase in, in taxes. There's scare tactics out there saying that, oh my gosh, we're going to be doubling our taxes. It's not going to happen. It just simply isn't going to happen. It's only 15% of our budget we're looking for, and we can work that out. But uh, smaller government to me is much better. And having out of warm taxes reflect your services is the way it should be done. Brian Eddy and certainly smaller government is, uh, is um, a good thing, but there's a balance. And uh, if, you, if you really think that um, we should continue just to shrink government, shrink government, shrink government, then I suggest you take a trip with me to uh, one of my uh, volunteer trips to uh, help in, in Haiti and you see what smaller government does not accomplish and uh, you 
you know, it's interesting. You, you, you get questions from the same people. You get questions or you catch hell about the uh, power plant and the other uh, enterprise funds contributing to the general fund. And that's not a good thing, you're told. And then they want you to compare Vero Beach with Sebastian, where Vero Beach has more employees. Well, yeah, we do have more employees. But if you want to compare Vero Beach with anybody, compare the ad valorem tax in Vero Beach, which is pretty low. And one of the reasons that it's low is because we have these enterprise funds and we have these employees that are making uh, making money. Uh, I think this this whole question, the, this uh, this whole philosophy um, with respect to uh, government being in business is pretty well going to end. We're we're on that path. We're on that road. I don't see anything stopping it. We're going to sell the power plant, and uh, that's pretty well going to end this whole line of question. Toby, could you repeat the question real quick? Sure. Sure, the question is not about selling the power plant. The question is using enterprise funds, those dollars, to pay for what is traditionally been paid for through Avalor taxes. Are you okay with that? You think Avalor taxes should pay for those services? Should there be visibility? You know, just expound on that concept as to where you stand, your philosophy. Okay, uh, Jay Kramer. Uh, first of all, I want to make sure everybody kind of gets the uh, the idea of essential services, and that is basically a service that uh, private industry does not take up, uh, and that government pretty much has to uh, to take up the uh, the slot there. Years ago, uh, FPNL did not want to serve this area. When I'm when I'm saying years ago, I'm saying pre uh, 1970s. Uh, Barrow Beach had to step up. We had to build a power plant. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm told crazy stories that we had to uh, run on certain days because people wanted to iron their clothes and it took so much energy to do that. But, uh, you know, the reason that we have the electric system is because it was an essential service. Uh, now, uh, you do have private industry that can't take that over. So the question is, is how do you unwind the process? You know, government had to step in, they had to get it here. Uh, it's the same with the water and sewer. Certainly, if government had not have stepped in and, and did a water and sewer, uh, you wouldn't have houses. Uh, you wouldn't have development. Government had to do that. So the question is, how do you unwind the system? Uh, and that is, is basically for, for private industry to step up and, uh, and sell, the, uh, sell the systems off. However, I would certainly hope that if you sell the systems off, that you do it at a competitive uh, uh, bidding process. Certainly, just uh, having competitors just show up on your doorstep and say, uh, we agree with all these philosophies, why don't you just give it to me and skip all the RFP process and skip the bidding process? I really don't agree with that. But as far as the essential services, if private industry can competitively take them over, I think we should do that. Utilizing enterprise funds in lieu of Avalor taxes uh, created many of the problem that we existed in the past 10 years within the city, allowing it to grow 550 employees, those excesses, the union benefits that were negotiated that are absolutely unconscionable. What taxpayer would have paid for, would have said, yes, I would have paid for triple overtime, or I would, I would have allowed them to bank vacation in sick time. But these were abuses that could happen because they no longer had to come to the taxpayer to ask for those funds. They could merely hide those costs along with this transfer. It, we definitely need a more transparent city government. You deserve to know what your government costs. All right, that concludes our questions. We would like for you all to make your closing statements. And we start with Craig on opening statements. Why don't we start with Dan and go the opposite direction. Dan, are you ready? Two minutes. Thank you, Toby. This is Dan Stump. Again, at the risk of sounding repetitive, uh, the main reason I'm running for a city council is I do want to sell the city electric system. I think you have heard good responses this evening from all candidates sitting up here. The best responses have been arguments in favor of selling the system. We simply cannot continue to maintain it. It's not cost efficient. 
And I don't want to have to rely upon other utility commissions in, in the state of Florida to get power. You know, there were, uh, if this, uh, people are complaining about where well, there's, there, there's an amount of money, there's a penalty, we have to pay the Orlando Utility Commission. We can, we can get our power from some other place. I think uh, someone mentioned uh, Winter Park, that they have a good system. You know, all we're doing is, is substituting one <laughs> inefficient power provider for another. The best power provider in the state of Florida is FDNL. They have the lowest rates. They're a good, strong, efficient company, and they have government regulation that the city of Vero Beach simply does not have, and we can't have. You can't expect five city council members, irregardless of their background, to be able to run, in this day and age, a utility system on par with FDNL. It simply can't be done, however good their intentions are. And all of these candidates are well-intentioned. This has been a fun campaign for me. I've enjoyed uh, speaking in these forums, and there's been at least a half a dozen of them. And uh, I, I really want to thank all the candidates here this evening for their fine participation. But my position remains firm. I will not waver if you elect me as your council member. I'm telling you this evening, if you vote me in, I'm going to conclude the sale of FPNL. I will not change my vote, and I won't make it a partial sale. Thank you for your attention. Nick Thomas, thank you. I think my friend Dan ended where I want to start, which is um, when you do the calculus of, of, of who you need to vote for in this case, um, if you are to return Mr. Fletcher and uh, Mayor Turner to uh, their seats, along with Tracy Carroll. You don't need Dan. You got your three. Right now it's three to two. Um, if you are pro-referendum, on the other hand, um, you're obviously going to go with Jay. Jay's pro-referendum. And Mr. Wainer's pro-referendum. So you need, if you're pro-referendum, uh, Nick Thomas is your guy. Um, here's the little twist I want to throw at you. If you, like me, are pro-referendum, but ready to just have the darn thing over with. We'll do the referendum, we'll make it fair, we'll make it fair, and, and do whatever the people want to do. But I am, uh, as I said when I came in this summer, I am eager, this is not what I want to talk about, FPNL. I want to get past this folly and get on with the real work of what our city council should do. So I'm gonna um, ask you that if, um, if you want to vote for Jay, and if you want to support Mr. Winger, um, that you add, you add me to the council. I will be a reliable, I am personally, I've been very clear personally against the deal, but I, I, I uh, pledge to you that I will uh, support a referendum. But here's, here's my little twist. After you voted for me and Jay, um, I'm gonna suggest you uh, think about uh, Pilar as your third vote. And not, not because I agree with her even remotely with regard to the FPNL deal, but rather um, I think, and from what I've gathered, she has in her heart um, uh, uh, positive feelings about our environment and wants to turn our attention to where it should be. And uh, as you may know, I'm very pro um, the lagoon and our environment. And I think Blar um, still has a lot of good work in her once we get the FBNL thing behind us. <laughs> Hello, Turner. Thank you very much for your kind words, Mr. Thomas. We'll make this brief. So say we are blessed to live in a very special community of great natural beauty. The key to preserving the quality of the life here is to put our city on a firm financial foundation. This is our opportunity. Let's not let it slip away. Please vote Turner for proven leadership and commitment to the city. Thank you. Jay Kramer. I sincerely want to thank all of you for coming out and listening to us. I'm certain uh, that sitting out there and watching us is probably not uh, the best use of your time. Uh, but I want to uh, really thank you for being involved in the political process and keeping us on our toes and keeping us sharp. The last two years have been quite an enjoyment. I certainly enjoy uh, expressing my uh, conservatism and more importantly, I certainly enjoy helping out the people of Vero Beach. We've had a lot of great projects gone through. We've certainly had a lot of challenges uh, that happened these last two years. We certainly have this FPL issue that just certainly will not go away. 
I certainly would like to make sure that this uh, comes to referendum. We get the facts on the table, and people just vote it, and we can move on with the business of the city. Certainly, the city is one that uh, is truly a treasure on the coast. If you have done a lot of traveling, every time you leave Vero Beach, you begin to see just how special Vero Beach is. And certainly, I would like to make sure that we continue to keep Vero Beach a very special place. And we can only do that by making sure that we make good, fiscal, conservative moves that keeps us on a firm footing. Uh, I would ask you on November 6th, please vote for Jay Kramer. I certainly want to continue working for you. <coughs> Brian Hetty, I'm someplace towards the middle of the table here, and on the ballot, I'm someplace towards the middle of the ballot. And uh, as you're looking down, make sure you stop on the Brian Hetty line and, uh, and connect those dots. The uh, Tea Party, thank you for giving the public the opportunity to hear this, and uh, thank you WTTV for, uh, for broadcasting this live. I don't know whether you intend to, to run any reruns on this. And uh, Keith, thank you, and, and Vero News uh, for again covering this, and uh, last time you put this on YouTube, which I think was a great service for the community. Uh, they could watch uh, this function and this debate in its entirety. And uh, it's a it's a great service, and uh, thank you and, uh, and your employers for providing that to the community. The uh, many people know that I spent a lot of, a lot of time uh, helping some veterans out, and I was driving a blind veteran to a local doctor uh, last week, and uh, I'm sitting in the waiting room. Somebody walked in. And, You're Mister Hattie. And he says, yeah, I get a lot of that. <laughs> so I, I know you from television. You're Mr. Hattie. I said, yeah, yeah, that's, that's me. I, I am. And he says, I want to tell you, you, you cost me a lot of time. I said, well, how is that? He said, well, when you were on city council, I used to watch the meetings more than once. I <laughs> so, sorry about that. He said, no, no, I wanted to thank you. Because I'll tell you what you do. You ask good questions, Brian, and you don't let them not give you an answer. And thanks a lot. We really appreciate the good questions. You want to hear more good questions? Put me back on City Council, Brian Hay. Craig Fletcher, uh, Toby, I do want to thank you for the, all the work you've done on behalf of uh, any River County in general. Um, and I will make this uh, pretty short. Two years ago, when Lar Turner and I started to run for an election and wanted to support the sale, they told us, everybody told us, this couldn't be done. Today, I think everybody is agreeing that yes, it can be done. We've overcome some huge hurdles that have uh, allowed us to go forward from where we are now. We're well on the way to getting this done. We all are going to read all the contracts. We're all going to review all the, all the paperwork. We're all going to take the time that, that we need to put into this to get it done. You're going to have this opportunity and this opportunity only to make the city whole and start out with a new, a new city. Please go to the polls, no matter who you vote for. But I would certainly ask you to vote for Craig Fletcher on November 6th. Thank you very much. All right. We'd like to thank the candidates for being here today and taking the heat. It's been a long process. You have a little further to go. Stay strong, stay with it. But let's show our appreciation for the candidates. Hang on, we're not quite done. I'd like to thank the audience for being here tonight. I'd like to thank those listening in on WTTV. And I'd like to remind you that the Inner River Tea Party has three tenets that we stand for. They are fiscal responsibility, free market solutions, and constitutionally limited government. Okay? You didn't hear me say anything about smaller government. 
You heard me say constitutionally limited government. Hopefully somewhere out there there's an appropriately sized government. Okay? You heard me say fiscal responsibility. We expect that on the part of every citizen and every governmental entity. And free market solutions. We think when you take free men and women and you place them in a uh, capitalistic system, history has proven you will generate more prosperity and more wealth than in any other system known to man. You mix that with our founding principles, a strong moral compass, Judeo-Christian values, and then you start what I heard the gentleman from FPL say the other day, the virtuous cycle. We turn our face back to those less fortunate and we help our friends and our neighbors. And it's responsible because it's done locally. Now we ask that when you go to the polls, that you understand that this country has gotten itself in numerous fiscal problems. It is not just the city of Vero Beach. You heard some of that tonight. But this election is big. You're going to vote at the state level, at the local level, and at the federal level. And we ask you to keep those tenants because those are the challenges that face our country today. Thank you for being here. God bless America.